how, how should robot, human robot interaction be done? As robots get better and better, we, the, robots are, the context for this talk is that robots are actually starting to work now. Uh, it's a very different than it was 10 years ago. I've been in the, in the robot business for about 20 years, and 20 years ago, robots were not very good at all, and they've got gradually better, and actually this, the, uh, the pace of improvement is accelerating, especially with uh, recent advances in machine learning. A lot of things are working now. So robots are coming. How should we interact with them? I'm going to make an argument in this talk that we already know how we should interact with them. And I'll give you some examples of how, we, how we're doing this. So um, we already know because um, the culture has been telling us how to design uh, interactions with intelligent autonomous agents for thousands of years. Here's a recent example. If you haven't seen this movie, Big Hero 6, it's wonderful. They do lots of examples of how you can interact with robots in a friendly way. Maybe this is a little bit too, too cozy. Maybe you, you know, there's too much robot in your face right now. But um, this robot's inspired by a real robot at Carnegie Mellon University that, that is soft and squishy like this. Um, but the, uh, the intelligence of the robot was, was made up for the movie. So this is a kind of a vision of human-robot interaction that's contemporary. When I was a kid, this was a vision of human-robot interaction, uh, 1975. Um, so maybe it's too ambitious to go to um, uh, beam, uh, the Big Hero 6 model, but maybe we can get towards this today. So I started to try and take this seriously as a goal uh, that we, maybe we can do in the, in the near future. Um, Leia is interacting with R2-D2, um, and this interaction is, uh, is very important. I don't know if you remember this part of the movie, but she's giving the Death Star plans to the robot. This is a critical plot point in the entire history of the Star Wars universe. This has got to be a reliable interaction. It's got to be quick. It's got to be easy. She doesn't need to be trained in human-robot interaction right now. That's just not going to be happening, right? So this is it's a crucial interaction. It's very fast, very smooth. So that's our inspiration. Um, we know, uh, the, the culture has told us how to interact with intelligent objects, intelligent artifacts. The 1940 uh, Fantasia, Mickey Mouse is using a gestural interface, whoops, to command these robots, right? So these, these are magical robots, but conceptually they're, they're robots. And you, the robots can tell what he wants them to do. So Leia um, me mechanically gives the RTD2 a thing and talks to him, or it, uh, Mickey is uh, using gestures. So these are, the culture nodes told us how to do these things. So that's 1940. But for thousands of years, people have been interacting with intelligent autonomous agents, so like, uh, like trained animals, for example. So the uh, vocab vocabulary for talking to a trained sheepdog um, is uh, a few tens of commands. And the, the, the uh, dogs are raised from, um, from when they're just born to, uh, to understand these commands. And the, these are very sophisticated commands. But we know how to share a task between an intelligent director and a also intelligent agent that's doing some of the work. It has different properties than the director. The dog can run much faster than the guy can. Right? That's the utility there. And it's cheaper, too. Um, arguably, well, I'm not going to talk about intelligence at all. We also can interact with, uh, we have interfaces that we've designed over thousands of years for autonomous air vehicles or air agents like, like this guy. So most cultures around the world have uh, hunting with, uh, with hawks um, and uh, it's still, still a popular pastime. And um, so we have interfaces that work over hundreds of meters which exploit the amazing sensing capability of this agent. This bird has crazy eyesight. It can see the gestures of the guy from a couple hundred meters away. Absolutely amazing. Maybe actually, maybe, maybe a lot more, maybe more like 800 meters. So we look around the culture, we see inspiration for all these different robot modalities or these different interaction modalities that we can exploit. Here's another one. Um, the uh, interactions between a, a trained service dog and the user are very sophisticated and uh, life-changing for, uh, for, the, for the operator, of course. All right, back to, back to Leia. Now, most of the research that, that goes on in human-robot interaction is exactly like this. A person is face to face with a robot and um, they are doing this kind of intimate interaction. So for example, this is an example from, um, uh, from the Karras lab at UBC, which is just up the road. The robot is paying attention to the human, the human's paying attention to the robot, they're engaged in. Here they're trading uh, not Death Star plans, but a water bottle and uh, um, 
Elizabeth Croft's work is to do this safely without the human losing, you know, losing their fingers in this interaction. That's her work. So 90%, roughly, of human-robot interaction work that's in the academic literature is like this. It's a kind of this intimate thing. I want to ask a different question. What about the other 10%? What about how did Leia get R2-D2's attention in the first place? Like, they didn't start the day like this, paying attention to each other, right? So how, do you, how can you get the attention of a robot that's going about his business um, and then begin an interaction with it? Because most of everybody else is dealing with the face-to-face -face stuff. I want to deal with setting this thing up in the first place. So um, here's my student, Yaroslav Litas, and he's um, getting the attention of these th three ground robots and then giving them commands by waving to them. So we're using gestures to give commands, but he, how is he getting the attention of each of these robots? Can you, can you see just by looking how he's, how does he get their attention? He's just looking at them, yeah. So it's so obvious, it's almost, it doesn't feel like you need to point it out, right? But to get the attention of a robot, he looks at the robot. It's a kind of interface you don't need to teach people about, but we had to do the engineering to make that work. The way that works, this is the viewpoint from each of those three robots, and we detect how frontal your face is for each of the three robots. And the robots have a superpower that uh, humans and animals don't. They can communicate with each other across the wireless network. In, in about uh, 50 milliseconds, they've uh, discussed with each other who is, the, uh, who is the user looking at the most right now, and one of those is, one of those is the most, and they, we run a, uh, a provably correct algorithm to elect one of them the winner. So this is happening under the hood in about 40 milliseconds. Um, the user doesn't perceive it, but it has this magical feeling. I can look around the room, and everybody knows, if I'm looking at you, you know, and everyone else knows that I'm not looking at them. It's, it's a kind of no interface interface. I keep coming back to this, uh, this thing. So it works just the way you always knew it should. Uh, here's another example. So, so the uh, f first one I showed you was the first example of people being able to select a robot from the group in this very natural way. So next we extended this to be able to select a group of robots and give them a command by, with a gesture again. So we're using gaze and gesture. Now this one is, this is one that's quite cute. I can show you how this works too. So I'm selecting the, these gentlemen here. So you guys know that I'm not selecting you, right? And these guys know I am selecting them. So how, do, how is that done? Well, it turns out to be, uh, there's a nice trick there. If you look at my face and you look at the ellipse described by my hand, if my face appears inside the ellipse, then it's you. If it appears outside the ellipse, it's not you, right? Super simple. But that's the kind of thing we can do reliably with the robots. We can track hands and faces fairly well. There's a caveat there. I'll come back to that. So again, the, th the pieces are simple. The work here is to make the pieces work really, really well, very reliably, and then we compose them into systems. So I'm trying to populate the space of interactions we can use. Yeah. So that was picking a, uh, a number of robots from a group that are, spaced, that are close together. Can we switch to the other mic for a second? Uh, okay, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to fake the sound. So uh, this is my student Shock Affair, and she says, "Oh no, it's not playing." That's why. All right, this video is very boring without the sound. I'm going to. I'm going to pretend. She says, "You two, take off." Now, what does "you two" mean? Well, "you two" means the two robots I'm looking at right now. And we did a, a study to find out whether it's better. If I say you two, should I look kind of at both of you? Should I look at the point in between you? Or should I look at you one at a time? It turns out that one at a time works best. Okay, so you two. So everyone hears the number two. So we have to do two rounds of that election that I mentioned before. And you can say UN, where N is any integer, and it works great. Um, you can also say, if you get the group wrong, you can, say, you can look at someone and say, not you. So, you, f you five, not you, right? And that works well with the robots too. And you knew you, knew you were currently deselected, right? I can, and then I can and you, I can add you back in. Right? That works with the robots too. Okay, so you've seen uh, picking one robot from a group, picking a subset of the robots spatially located. We've been able to pick an arbitrary, um, an arbitrary number of robots by looking at them one at a time. And then we've been able to modify the group by adding and removing subsequent robots. So we covered all of these cases. The next thing that, well, so this is around 2012. We've got to by now. And the new thing then was, uh, uh, was UAVs, drones. These were, they'd just started to work and become affordable about this time. So this is my student, Mani Manajami. 
Um, the video you see in the bottom right-hand corner is the, is the video feed from the UAVs. I'm sorry about the lack of sound. Um, so what Manny is going to do is look at the robot he wants to command. And so the, the input to the vehicles is exactly this video. Um, so they do all the image processing based on that. So he looks at the robot he wants to give him a command to, and, and this means add yourself to the group. So he adds the robot on the right, then he adds the robot on the left, and then he's going to wave his other hand to remove the robot on the left. So we're doing this creating the team and then modifying it, uh, but now we're doing it with vehicles in flight. So this is the first barehanded uh, command and control of UAVs in flight. Um, you can, this stuff is commercial now, you can buy this, but we did it first. And then he, uh, he gives a, let me, I was looking away when we did the last bit. Then at the end he gives a command to the team and any member of the team perceives the command. So this means do the mission. In this case the mission is very short and exciting. There you go. All right, so now we're doing a barehanded command and control, creating teams and modifying it of UAVs in flight. Um, so, um, single robots, multiple robots, teams of robots, modifying the teams, now we can do it in flight. So we've put together all of these pieces, and the interfaces are quite simple. Um, I'm gonna just, just give me a second, I'm gonna see if I can get the sound back here. I'm sorry that this wasn't working. The sound is really important in this one. It sure is, yeah. Oh well, I'm gonna have to uh, pretend the sounds. You won't believe me if I make the sounds up. But <laughs> All right. Yeah, no sound, okay. So in this, we've sped it up by a factor of two. So this robot, um, um, what it loves to do is it loves to be helpful and take softballs from people and give them to other people. If you wanna give it a softball, how do you indicate you wanna give? Well, you just offer it a softball and it will come and take it. So this is kind of a no interface interface. If I wanted to give uh, this gentleman something, I could do this. And that's how you tell the robot you wanna give it something. And it can perceive that and come get it. So now the robot has a softball. The robot loves to give softballs to people, so it's gonna offer it to Zhao. And so right now the robot is going It sounds impatient, it wants you to interact with it. It's like a dog that looks at you with those big eyes and starts panting, right? And then when Zhao didn't reach out for the ball, the robot said, and then turn over and, do, and this, you, there's no way that you don't understand what the robot's thinking. You just can't help it, right? It's got that R2-D2 thing. R2-D2 doesn't speak English, but you know what r 2 d is thinking because the sounds are carefully designed. This time, Zhao says, please give me the ball. He reaches out for it. So here's another one with two robots. Uh, the robots, find, they find a person. They use this a whole suite of sensors to robustly find a person. Now they're both going, do 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 And this robot is still saying, Sorry, the robot on the left is still saying, doo, 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 and then it goes, hmm. And you know exactly what it's thinking, right? You know that it's no longer attending to that person. You know it's no longer uh, looking for commands from that person. All from that sound, hmm. I wish you could have heard it. You can find this stuff on my website or on YouTube. All right, so we've got a series of demos there which were in controlled environments in the lab. This is not where you want robots, particularly in the lab. We have. Uh, the key thing is we can control the lighting conditions in the lab, because computer vision is really hard. Computer vision is one of those things that until very recently just didn't work very well. So we were on the edge of, um, on the edge of getting that stuff to work. But we want to scale up. We want to scale up to large distances, and we want to scale up to outdoors. So if you want to give R2-D2 the secret plans now, first you've got to get R2-D2 to come to you. Right? You've got to get his attention from a long way away. Outdoors, uncontrolled lighting, uh, um, and you appear very small to R2-D2 right now. So let's find a way into doing that. We'll get the stuff out of the lab and into the world. But first, um, again, I, I want to have interfaces that feel effortless, that, that kind of no interface interface. I don't want to train you. So let's do a study to find out what do people do if you ask them, make the robot come to you. So we did an experiment where that's the only instruction we gave people. Here's the setup. The participant is in, in the middle there and they're told to stand still. The robot is eight meters away and facing away from them. And the instructions are, make the robot come to you. So that's what she does, right? She does this. So what do people do? I wish you could hear this. I'm gonna try and I'll act out some of this as well. So this is what people do. They say, come on robot, here robot. Come on robot, good robot, well done robot. 
That's honestly what they're saying. Okay. So, so this, uh, the woman on the bottom left is interesting. She's kind of, what's she doing? She's steer, is she steering the robot? What does, what's, what does she think the robot perceives? I think this was a really, really interesting study. So we could categorize what people do. Here's another set of people. Whoops. Again, so the top right, the guy's clapping. Um, top left, um, she, is, uh, showing, she is showing that she's paying deep attention to the robot. Right? She's really engaged with the robot like this. Um, the guy on the left, he's just, you can't hear it, he's shouting the whole time. He's saying, come on, buddy, come on. He's got a very strong Iranian accent. There's nobody more Canadian than the uh, new Iranian immigrant. Wonderful. He has the shirt. Come on, buddy, good robot. So that's what people do. So people do things like they gesture, they clap, they make sound. Uh, they do this. This is really good for computer vision, right? So it's, it's in the plane of the camera. It makes as many pixels change as, as possible. This is the one we like. This one is terrible for computer vision, right? If you're far away, very few pixels are changing, very difficult. That's why when you want to greet someone across a football stadium, you do that and you don't do this, right? But over these scales, this works for humans and animals. And there was this leaning forward, this attention thing. Um, um, the, the woman second to the end, was she was kind of controlling the robot, or at least in her head she was. The guy on the right was really interesting. He did nothing at all. The instruction was make the robot come to you. He did nothing. He stood there absolutely still. What his plan was, I, I don't know. But that's what people do. Okay. So that's a useful, if ever you want to know what do people do when say make robot come to you, there's a useful reference for you if, you, if that's what your life is like, because mine is. All right. So let's take this thing we found. People do this. Lots of people do this. Um, it's really convenient for us because it's a big signal. Um, this is a two hertz um, signal. Um, and th th so it does, if you ask someone to wave, they wave at two hertz, plus minus a bit. No one does this or this, right? It's always two hertz. It's pretty interesting. So we can look for two hertz signals. We can look for patches of image that are changing with a fundamental frequency of two hertz. Okay, so somewhere hidden in this picture is uh, my student Chris, who wants the robot to come to him. Can you see Chris? I can't even see Chris, and I'm looking at the screen right now. No, but once we turn the uh, movie on, you'll see Chris because he's waving. You see him? It's still not very easy, but the robot can see Chris. So all the other people in this movie are just random students going to and from the bus. We, these are not you know, my controlled stooges. These are real people, and Chris wants the robot, and uh, the robot can come to him reliably. So we can get the robot to come from about 60, 70 meters away, where you're really, you're really small at that point. But this is just a very, very robust signal. Now, unfortunately, um, the, the sad part of the story, this is also two hertz, right? My legs are flickering at two hertz. So what we have to do um, here is we have to ignore things which are moving relative to the world frame and only pay attention to things which are still. So if I did this, it would, it would think I was trying to get its attention, right? But it ignores me if I'm actually walking. So the limitation there is the robot has to be still while it's looking for waving. That's not good. It's particularly not good if you're flying, because if you're flying, it's impossible to be still. You just can't do it. So to achieve this, so we like to do difficult things. So to achieve this uh, on the flying vehicle, um, we do the following thing. At this point, it gets a little complicated. So right now, we want to ignore the running guy and pay attention to the waving guy. There's the waving guy. So the way we have to do this is we actually create a complete 3D model of the world uh, it, using real-time visual uh, construction on the robot, so complete um, visual odometry pipeline. Some of you know what that means. For the others, it doesn't matter. But we do a huge amount of computation on the robot to figure out what the world looks like so that we can figure out um, what's moving relative to the world. And now, with that, we can figure out that this two hertz signal with the guy in white, um, he's stationary with respect to the world, so we won't pay attention to him. And you see with the robot, the robot does a wing waggle. I don't know if you know this, but if you're lost in the, in the hills and a, um, a plane comes and spots you, the pilot will waggle their wings to say they see you, right? There's nothing, not much else they can do. So the wing waggle is the, the traditional ICU signal for flying vehicles. So the robot does a wing waggle. So this is the first time that we've managed to get the attention of a UAV in flight, um, outdoor, under real conditions, and all the computation is done on board the vehicle. So we can get the robot's attention now. All right, so you put the pieces together. Now what we want to do is to do the first demonstration of getting a robot's attention in flight, getting it to come to me, and then giving it a command. 
in a close range interaction. So this is, Leia gets up in the morning, she wants flying R2-D2 to come to her and give her give the secret plans. Okay, so this is the, uh, the lighting is not very bright in this video because robot experiments take, the first time it works, you have to, it takes seven hours to get the first one to work. So it's always dusk in robot videos because grad students don't get up till 10 o'clock, if you're lucky. All right, so some of these people are my students. Some of these people are just heading for the bus. Uh, we have a pretty, a pretty bad vision system right now that's, that's um, trying to find where the people are. You'll see it notices some people. And then it's gonna, note it's gonna figure out that one of the people is waving at two hertz. The Sepa is waving, and when it notices him, it will uh, lock on to him about now. There you go. So now um, the vehicle now uh, flashes its lights so the Sepa knows he can stop waving, and it does this visual servo behavior, which means it, it, it tries to uh, go towards the thing it's looking in the image. Look how big the scale change. Right? Every pixel in that reticle is changing every frame. Huge scale change. It finds his face, reads the motion gesture. That was the selfie picture. That's the selfie, the selfie gesture. And this is the I'm done gesture. So now what the robot does is turns around, it flies off. And for some reason, the grad students stopped the video at that point. It bro broke my heart. But so the, the thing that's amazing about this, I'm not sure if it, if it comes across how difficult that was. That, that demo took us a year and a half because the computer vision is, was just, just on the edge of doable. A very talented engineer who now works for Apple um, doing difficult things there as well. So um, this was absolutely on the edge of what was doable with the computer vision at the time. So let's, something amazing happened to computer vision recently right, for, for many applications. So this is how we were doing the computer vision before. We can track faces fairly well. Faces are easy. I don't know if you realize this, but faces are actually designed to be easy to see. Right? Everyone's face has these strong edges and these dark shadows for your brow and your thing. That's on purpose, right? So your brain and your face evol evolved together to be easy, to be good at seeing faces and for faces to be easy to see, right? So faces are fiducials in the lingo. Just like those patches on the wall, these are fiducials for computer vision. Your face is a fiducial for human brains. We can track face as well. Motion is also easy to see. So that, that pink spot here is, um, is where we're adding together the, uh, the motion that we detect in the image over a handful of frames. So that's why, and that stuff works really well. It was kind of at the limit of what we could do outdoors uh, back in 2013. And then recently this happened. The difference in, in, in fidelity and quality and speed is amazing. So this is, this is using deep neural networks that you've um, heard of, no doubt. Maybe some of you use them every day. Um, now, it looks like we're tracking the hands and faces. We are not. We're detecting them independently in each frame. It looks like it's tracking because your brain is, is doing the data association from frame to frame because the detections are very, very, very good. So this, is, this runs in real time, um, no problem, right? 30 hertz, if it, it runs at 60 hertz, but our camera only gets data at 30 hertz. So this is kind of amazing. So now we can, look how happy we all are. We're happy because the robot stuff actually works really, really well. All right, so now we can do this. Now we're not just sort of grasping, looking for a little bit of, of motion. We can actually track hands and faces uh, under real lighting conditions outdoors in Vancouver in February. Um, so what can we do now? So this is the very latest um, stage we've got to with this stuff. Right now, the robot is on the ground, and, and it can see, um, it's not super clear on the screen, but it can see Pratik's hands and face in the top right-hand corner. The, the top right-hand corner image is what the robot sees. So Pratik is going to get the robot to pay attention, and then and he's going to give it a command, the takeoff command, so it takes off. So we can give these um, binary commands, like do this now, do this now. We have a library of commands. This is takeoff, this is land, this is selfie. Okay? But now we have a new thing. So we, now we do the same system as before. We look for, uh, uh, look for waving things to get the robot's attention, and that works very well. We get the robot to come in, uh, approach over about uh, 18, 18 or 20 meters. And now we can do a new thing. As well as this library of commands, we can actually give continuous commands. I can give continuous value gestures. So now what Sepa's doing now, he's flying the robot. When you hold your hand up like this, he's steering the robot with his hand. There's a selfie gesture. There's the selfie. But he's going up, down, up again, right? 
So this is the first time that that's, that's been demonstrated as well. So we're still a bit ahead of the commercial manufacturers like DJI and Parrot, um, but um, not very, we're not very far ahead of them anymore. So I'm gonna stop doing this work because these large companies with enormous resources, um, they, we showed them how to do the early stuff and they're getting closer and closer and closer behind us. So as a, as a professor, my job is to be out for the, looking for the next thing, so we'd, we're, we've stopped doing that. But you can buy some of it uh, from a huge Chinese corporation, which is great. Okay, a couple more quick things. Um, other things in the repertoire, pointing. Pointing is super useful. Uh, so we could give these continuous gestures before, so pointing is a special gesture. It's, I can manipulate your attention. I can draw your attention. I look at you, but there. You, you're trying really hard not to look over there, right? I'm manipulating your attention by pointing. Very strong signal. This uh, very uh, badly trained agent can do it. Um, uh, you can do it in, 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 other, in context where there are lots of people. Everyone knows what this means. Animals can understand it, right? So it's simple enough that we can, animals know, know what this means. Interestingly, animals can even do it, right? This is a, uh, I think this is a setter, not a pointer. Maybe, I'm, anyone know dogs, what kind of dog this is? But um, this is a, a gesture, this has been used for hundreds of years, at least, maybe thousands. This leg up means I'm pointing now, and then the dog points to a bird that's fallen in the grass, right? It's a hunting dog. So do animals can do pointing, so everyone does pointing. We can reuse the system we had before, very, very simply, using a, a RGBD camera. That is a camera where we have the colors and also the depth for every pixel, the distance from the camera to the pixel. And the, the uh, most famous example of this device is the Kinect that comes with Xbox. It's a uh, low cost device, works pretty well. So now we can segment the hands and faces using the method I told you before. And now we can find the depth associated with hand pixels and, and uh, face pixels from this image. And so then now we have a cloud of pixels in 3D, which is your face, and a cloud of pixels with your, with your hands. And now we have to do some statistics on these clouds of pixels to figure out accurately which way you're pointing. Okay, so we, we, um, there's a, a paper you can read if you care. We do some elementary statistics and we can get pointing in 3D really, really quite robustly, including pointing behind you. So um, the pointing was very cheap once we'd figured out the, uh, the basic technique. All right, last thing is following. Following is my favorite no interface interface, right? You're doing a fairly sophisticated interaction with a robot and you're literally not even attending to it. Just, there's a robot following me. I'm not, you know, there's no interface to that at all, but it, get, it gets quite a lot of stuff done. So we knew this in 1940. Here's an autonomous agent following Mickey. Following has received a lot of attention in the literature. It's very, very useful. This is Big Dog, um, which was a project developed for the uh, US Marine Corps by Boston Dynamics. So the fact that this works so well outdoors uh, in these lighting conditions was really spectacular back in the day. It's easier now. Computer vision's got better, as I, as I told you. But following, there's tons of work on following. My problem with following is that you don't always want the robot to be behind you, right? I want Big Dog to get its legs blown off by a landmine, not the Marine. I want that a lot, right? I, I, that would be very bad. So, here's another case where the dog is, is following the person, but it's following in front of the person. So this is kind of interesting. So following in front, you're following somebody, but you want to be in front of them. It's a really, really interesting problem because you've got to figure out where you think they're going to go. So you have to have a model of the person. What, what are they intending to do right now? And a control system that can execute that. And if you get it wrong, you've got to recover. So here's our first cut of this, and this is the first time anybody's done this. So this robot is following Piam, but it's doing it from the front. In this case, it's very easy to figure out where he's going to go. He thinks, well, I'm going to assume that, that Piam's going to go straight, until there's an obstacle, and then he's gonna turn around the obstacle. In this case, it's more difficult, because there are choices. So the robot's gonna make the wrong guess here, and then it, and Pyam indicates that the robot got it wrong, and the robot re recovers really quickly. Now, so this is a really rough first cut of this, but I think this problem has uh, got a long way to go. Imagine you're mountain biking down a forest trail, and you can have a drone in front of you, f uh, filming you, but now you can see your face, or you're skiing, or you're windsurfing, right? Kind of more exciting than seeing your butt the whole time. Well, maybe. All right, so what I've shown you here is, whoops. Um, what I, I think this is, it's human-robot interaction like you always knew it should be. Um, it, it feels like nothing in many cases. So this is a little bit contrived, right? But the pointing, the looking, um, the waving to get someone's attention far away, it doesn't feel like anything special. So we're trying to fill the playbook of human-robot interaction stuff 
of choices so we can build systems from these components. And we, in every case I've shown you was the first demonstration of that kind in the world. So what? Who cares? You don't have a, a robot interaction problem today. There are no robots in this room. If you have a robot, it's probably a Roomba. It's got a big button that says, clean my floor. Right? So you don't have a human-robot interaction problem yet. But you're going to care about this a lot any day now. Because these are going to be robots really soon. It's already happening. In, um, I, li I live down in Silicon Valley right now. And uh, if you drive around Mountain View, you can sometimes see three, four, five Waymo cars at the same time. Right? It's, there's a lot of them around. And they're completely autonomous most of the time. So why do you need human-robot interaction with this thing? Well, this is a well-behaved example. This is a kind of German setup, controlled lighting, uh, high-quality car, uh, good attention for the, the, you know, the German gentleman is in the middle of the crosswalk. Everything is good. That's how we do it in England. Uh, this is the second most famous crosswalk in the world. This is the Shinjuku Station in, in Tokyo. Um, now there are lots of agents. Imagine that some or all of these vehicles are robots now. And now these people are well behaved. This is a very uh, uh, carefully managed intersection. Uh, the people and the cars are separated largely. Right? That's what happens at Shinjuku. This is India. It's just a different way of dealing with crosswalks right? in, in there in cities in India. The cars and the people are mixed up. How is a robot car going to ever, ever, ever get across this crosswalk? It's going to have to convince people to get out of its way. Like, I, I'm, I'm going here, right? And the people, how are they going to make sure that this that robot car is not going to kill them? So we use things like careful use of eye contact, right? You, you make eye contact with the driver. I'm going. I dare you to kill me, right? Or even more, I'm not going to make eye contact with you. I dare you to kill me, right? That's the most aggressive thing you can do. So manipulating the attention of all these vehicles is going to be super important right now. So you will care about this. Just in case the uh, North Americans are feeling superior to India, this is Boston, which is also similarly, uh, similarly. So people and cars just mixed up, right? Um, when you can't make eye contact with the driver anymore, what do you do now? Right? It's an important safety feature thing. So we're all going to care about human-robot interaction of the style I've been talking about, and we're going to care about it very soon. So these are the wonderful people that did the work, the students in my lab. And uh, um, thank you for paying attention. This is our university just 12 kilometers from here. Thanks.